The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. Hey, hey, hey. All righty. We're going to put you on mute for a second on our end. Okay. All right, so or no, we're going to mute ourselves <laughs> is what I mean. <laughs> we gotta try, okay, I'm so, going to try um, to grab enough Yes, as you go. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, go for it, man. Grab, grab a coffee. Um, take care of the espresso machine. Obviously, priority number one. Um, priority number two, uh, make some, some cool trades. Make some good trades. Um, which so far this week, Monero has been pretty good. Um, we've been uh, gradually moving up. Notice that our plug line right here, this guy held pretty well. Um, so broke through it, had a retest. This is like this is pretty classic action that you would use for plug lines, right? Yeah, you, you, you broke with strength, you came back down, kind of tested it, and then made a couple of days above it. And then uh, and then the price action has has been positive ever since. Um, so that's uh that's nice. We're looking at um, we can go to the weekly here and get a little bit of a, a better zoomed out view of what's going on. And effectively, there's this really long line that that started in 2017 that we've drawn. And unfortunately, that was broken down uh, last year. But there is there is some potential here. There, there's a long way to get back to this line, right? The, getting back to the underside of this line would, would, would take some time. Typically, one thing I've seen in crypto is that if you break down a big line like this, there's often, you know, because crypto does tend to go up and sometimes violently. There is a good chance at some point to try and touch the underside of this line again. Um, personally, I've just resolved myself that I'm not like I just Monero is not about gains for me. I'm not here to be like, all right, let's you know everyone buy Monero and we can all buy it together and pump this price more. Um, I would like to see it continue going up steadily, but I would also like that to be concurrent with something like the transaction counts here. So you'll notice uh, we had obviously the quote unquote black ball attack or whatever it was, spam attack. Um, that only lasted for a little bit, um, kind of did us a favor, right? Uh, these are, this revealed some growing pains that things that were fixed in the wallet, that was good. And transactions have been kind of steadily bumping to the, towards the upside here. It would be difficult for us to call these, this level of transactions, a, an attack, like a black ball attack or a spam attack. Like why the hell would someone pay extra money to bump the transactions from, I don't know, 25, 30 up to 40 and 50. They're not accomplishing anything. They're, they're not getting much out of that. Like, okay, maybe you're kind of reducing a little bit the ring set size. Maybe you're targeting some specific outputs, um, potentially from, um, what was that guy's name, um, with the with the darknet market incognito that, that, <laughs> that tried to rug and then karma came back at him. Really weird situation. I think um, some of us suspected, it, it's like he was so knowledgeable about privacy and then did so bad at his own OPSEC, some of us were like, yeah, is this, is this guy a fed? What's going on here? But at any rate, who knows? Um, what I do like here is that we're seeing the transaction counts have slowly um, moved to the upside. And that has been concurrent here with a little bit of price increase for Monero over the past, uh, let's just call it month, almost two months now. Um, so in, in a more general sense, in a more broad sense regarding our price, um, you know, we, we effectively found the bottom after getting delisted from from Binance which interestingly it wasn't the delisting it was it was the news of the delisting that actually crushed price for a week um, and then after that you know we had some some sideways action but you'll notice we're we're still i mean it's just this is the zone right here right this is obviously apparently this is XMR's stable like fair market stable price um minus the fractional reserve that's probably still happening on on the exchanges that do have Monero so uh, it's, you know, I mean, this is, this is a good thing. Like a stable price, a stable value is a good thing. Um, I, I just, I like to see that. Let's take a look at the wave magic here and you can kind of wave magic helps you to visualize certain things. You can eventually you, you get to the point where you can really just see it, uh, without having to necessarily turn it on. But yeah, these, these standard deviation bands that we've been inside of, you can see here the blue bands right there, right? Effectively. And, and at the very, very top, right, you've got those. And then kind of the bottom orange orange bands here as well. Um, one thing that I do like, especially that is that we've gotten back into this lower orange band set right there. That's that's a really good indication that that we're probably done with with the worst of of this crashing, or at least the Binance induced crashing. It's a very very good thing to see us get back into this zone here. It actually establishes a type of strength that hey, 
these bands actually do represent uh, something that's important for us in, in, in a psychological sense. Monero does have this tendency to want to stay above the 130 mark. Like that's this zone is our fair value zone, if you want to call it that. Um, obviously, again, minus fraction reserve. So price doing well uh, this week. Kind of glad, you know, actually really glad to see it um, because having bad price does dissuade your sort of fair weather patriots right here, uh, your sunshine patriots. Um, the people that are in crypto for the freedom, but also for the gains, right? They're like one foot in, one foot out. This it, that does dissuade people from using it, and I really, really hate to um, to listen to that one laser-eyed group of people that will constantly just point at at a chart and be like, "Oh, it doesn't matter about your freedom because uh, I didn't make enough money off of it," right? Uh, I, that's that's just an annoying thing to have to to constantly hear. So, anyways, um, yeah, nice, good, steady gains here happening over the past month or so in Monero. Uh, that's that's can only be a good thing. And in the same vein, you will notice that the XMR BTC chart is also doing quite well. Um, well, not quite well, uh, <laughs> not in terms of, you know, since since last year, but in terms of the past few weeks, um, yes, our prices relative to Bitcoin has been doing pretty well. With the the recent pump that's happened, we've, we've taken a little bit of a dip here in the last week, particularly um, this red candle, which was effectively motivated by the ETH ETF. Um, so we'll talk about that. Colloquially, we could say the ETH ETF is approved. It's kind of approved. It's going to be approved. It's going to get listed. Right now, it's not listed. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but overall, yeah, I mean, the, again, still kind of establishing some sort of bottoming pattern here. Hopefully, probably, I still want to see this thing make it back to, to really where some kind of reasonable resistance and retest should happen. And a sane, rational market, which we've talked about since forever, markets are not sane. They're not rational. They're not efficient and they're not organic. Um, <laughs> still though, even in irrational, inorganic, inefficient markets, you, you still should get some kind of reasonable price action that, that brings you back to a retest of previous levels. So this, again, this, this is just motivated by heavy speculation and probably leverage as well. So probably leverage, almost certainly leverage. Uh, okay, same story here with the with the XMR ETH chart. You'll notice here that that the fall off was more significant again because the Ethereum ETF had had good news last week. We sort of talked about that last Saturday, um, but uh, yeah, because it was the ETH ETF, right? XMR has not performed as well relative to ETH. Nevertheless, you'll notice here that that's still basically just exploring the bottom of the recent range. So this again still looks like a plausible bottoming pattern. This still looks like at some point it should make it up here. However, you know, wave magic, again, as we've talked about before, statistics, when we're looking at like statistical metrics um, or visualizations, this doesn't tell you fundamentals, right? It, it can. And in a lot of cases, the evidence of insider knowledge shows up inside of charts and inside of technical analysis, inside of price action and the way that it, it unfolds. However, you can't just say like, like for the, for example, the Bitcoin regression, we can't just be like, oh, this regression is like perfect. It's magic and, you know, statistical magic and praise science, right? We, we can't, we can't take that approach. We just have to understand what they're useful for and, uh, and understand its limitations. Right now, what I'm telling you is that the limitation of the XMR divided by Ethereum chart, the limitation is that Ethereum is about to get listed as an ETF on the big broad financial markets and is probably going to see significant real money inflows which means that this chart, in, in terms of like, hey, this looks like a bottoming pattern. Hey, you know, we should retest the underside of, of this wave magic line, the, the lower standard deviation bands. Normally, you would say that that's what should happen in a, in a sort of TA standpoint. But because the fundamentals are also telling us that Ethereum could be about to get some huge inflows of cash, this chart might break down. Like this chart could break down without actually um, hitting, without actually hitting these levels that, you know, we kind of would have hoped to rebound to. So just just know that that's out there. Know that that um, again, like qualifying, trying to understand like what are the metrics, what are we looking at, and um, you know, and putting that into a broader context. So um, nothing to see with the price divergences here. Yeah, I guess Poloniex, you know, they they went down to about half a percent below Kraken. Eh, that's you know for Poloniex, that's that's actually really good. Um, very good for for Justin Sun's activities. Uh, let's take a look at XMR versus. The the gold price gold has also been doing quite well. Um, I like this wave magic much better than I like the USD chart. Um, 
I think it makes some sense to look at things versus gold. And I do notice that charts often are cleaner versus gold than they are against the U.S. dollar. That makes some sense if you think about it, because the U.S. dollar hides inflation and they, they do like tricky things. And um, it's not always the case. But at any rate, uh, what we're seeing here is the lower, the very long term, lower standard deviations. Uh, Monero found kind of some support down there. And uh, we're, we're basically getting back into this range. I I would expect that Monero should be able to effectively hold its price relative to gold for at least the coming months um, and probably make some more gains. In general, what I would expect to see is these bands curling under and then Monero sort of exploring some kind of range in here like that. Um, because I, I am on uh, somewhat of a bullish thesis on gold um, for the meantime. So gold is, is still looking pretty good. So that's what XMR looks like today uh, on this, this lovely Saturday. Um, let's, let's go ahead and pivot here and talk about Ethereum. So, uh, we had talked about it Saturday. We, we had talked about the Ethereum BTC chart and I was kind of telling you guys, yeah, this chart looks terrible. However, um, this is actually probably a good opportunity to scoop up some XMR. Like if you're into trading ratios and things like that, that nothing goes down a straight line forever. And that the Ethereum versus Bitcoin chart has had kind of like a long bleed out period here. Um, and the other thing that also gets me is that, uh, you know, like I just I just know in a fundamental sense that Ethereum does all the stuff that Bitcoin doesn't and can't. And the only thing that Bitcoiners can do now is talk about how eventually with some crazy layer two magic and Enigma network and UTXO sharing and like it doesn't matter. Opcat, you insert whatever little cute name thing they want. They're always they're, like what they're saying now is we're going to be able to do everything Ethereum can. It's like, oh, great. Like when, <laughs> you know, like, is that your claim to fame? Oh, OK, sure. Um, and yeah, I know probably there's a lot of Bitcoiners in the in the audience right now that are turning over that are that are shaking their fist uh, at, through the screen at me. Um, but any rate, <laughs> anyways, the point is that Ethereum does a lot of stuff that Bitcoin doesn't. And Bitcoin can only hope that eventually it could do the stuff that Ethereum is doing um, with some crazy layer two. The point is that when I see big, when I see like a coin like Ethereum that has big market cap and big interest and has this like long term fundamentally support line here, and then that gets broken down, even though we know the Ethereum ETF is going to get approved, this breakdown here is a combination of probably um, a little bit of uh, like stop hunts and, and stuff like that, trying to induce fear, getting people to sell their positions off cheap and then eventually reacquiring them. Um, but it's also just in general, like people, people are fearful. People were like people did believe the dumb um, narratives from maximalists that said Ethereum is in a, a security and will never get approved. Right. All, all the sailor kind of bullshit. Um, so it's kind of probably a reflection of both of those. At the moment, um, you'll notice that things, it is testing the underside of this, this line that broke down. It was support, now it's resistance. Um, I tend to think that there's a good chance that this line is going to get broken. It could take some time. Um, you know, it was, it was kind of a, it was, it was a bit of an event that, that got things down there to that point. Obviously, Bitcoin had the halving and it, it had all the, it had runes. It had, uh, it had ETF, of course. So the, the thing is that Ethereum, let, let's talk about specifically what happened, right? Let's 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 actually analyze that. So there are two forms apparently that need to be approved. One of them is the 16B, I believe it's 16B4. Um, what the SEC did is they approved the 16B4. Everyone thought they were gonna like it was 25% chance, like in the gambling markets or whatever. It was like some something like 25% chance to be approved. Um, and then on Monday or Tuesday, the SEC did an about face and then asked for all the companies, you know, BlackRock and Valkyrie, et cetera. They said, hey, can you update your 16B4, uh, 16B4 forms? Um, you know, we need you to do an emergency um, uh, update on those forms, which was a sign, hey, they're going to approve it. Then on Thursday, they said, okay, your 16B4s are approved and everyone celebrated and popped the champagne, but that might have been premature because you still need to get the S1Bs approved. And the S1B is like the actual order that says, all right, list it on the exchange, it's go time. So right now it's not go time and there is a lot of debate um, about you know how long that will take. I wouldn't expect should necessarily take a long time. I don't see why the SEC would would approve the 16 B4s and then just be like, all right, just kidding. Uh, you know, we're not going to approve this for like three months as we haggle over your actual um, final order to, to put the to put the ETF onto onto the actual traded environment. Um Nevertheless, you know, what do I know? And I also, the one thing I do know is that, is that Gensler and the SEC and these insiders, they do like to kind of jack things around a little bit. So there, there might be a little bit of opportunity for them here to, um, to play with this. Remember when the Bitcoin ETF got approved, 
someone quote unquote hacked Gensler's, I can't remember if it was Gensler or the SEC, but someone hacked quote unquote their Twitter and said, Oh, your Bitcoin is approved. And they're like, no, no, we didn't do that. Uh, it's not approved. And then like 24 hours later it was approved. And so it was just like a whole weird thing. Um, it's difficult for me to believe that they got hacked and that someone hacked them, some black hat hacked their Twitter account to post that one thing when they could have posted any number of things that would have been, um, you know, that they could have milked for even more profit. So anyways, who knows um, exactly how this is going to unfold. But the general point is that Ethereum is getting listed onto, onto the traded environment of the traditional stock market. It's getting a spot ETF. So that means real cash inflows from boomers or from whoever's on the stock market. Real cash can now make its way into Ethereum via the stock market because that's what a spot ETF does. That's important for us. That that signals the potential for alt season. That signals the potential for more gains in the Ethereum versus Bitcoin chart. Um, and it destroys a lot of just bullshit narratives, right? It just it destroys a lot of the things. Maximalists have said since forever that the Ethereum meets Ethereum's a security and it won't be approved. And and it's just been wrong, right? Like just yet another thing. Just add it to the list, guys. So I think that's good. I think that that can only be a good thing. Um, you know, the maximalists were trying to milk the whole ETF thing for as much as they could for relative price performance, um, and, and rather than like taking a neutral position and trying to analyze reality, the markets and our environments um, as, as best they can without like trying to, you know, shill their own narratives. So anyways, with, <laughs> with that out of the way, um, let's see. Oh, you know what? It's that's not quite out of the way. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out to you guys here is link. Um, man, Link, for whatever reason, gives us signal before something big happens. Um, it's a little bit harder to see. Let me let me turn up the, uh, uh, where's the style? No, that's not it. Here we go. All right, there we go. Make those lines a little bit thicker. Actually, let me zoom in more. I always forget that it's it can be hard to see things. Okay, so um, Link is in white, and I just want you to see here, Link pumped before everything else pumped back in February. And that was a signal that that things were about to get saucy, right? Things were about to move to the upside. Now, it's a little bit harder to see right here, um, but you'll notice that, again, Link pumped almost solo, right? It pumped a good bit here, even though it was like kind of down in the doldrums for a while. But Link pumped, and then the Ethereum ETF got approved like right about here. So the news, the news came um, on Monday. Uh, that that the SEC wanted them to update their their forms, and then on Thursday the ETF actually, or I mean the ETF got approved. Yes, it's approved, but it's still not listed, if you will. At any rate, the point is that Ethereum, uh, sorry, that Link here tends to pump when Link pumps solo against the rest of the market. Um, that's a signal that something is coming, right? That that typically has been a signal. Link pumped early here. Um, back in November when things you know were turning around, like again, Link pumped first. So. My guess is that Link has something to do, you know, so it's an Oracle chain um, and it's a, it's a cross chain Oracle. So my guess is that it has something to do with insiders taking positions on chain and that Link is sort of an maybe I need to really try and track this down at some point um, and, and figure out the mechanism why. But my sort of fuzzy guess on this, my fuzzy, um, I, I don't know, guess is that. Link has something to do with getting into and out of positions, crossing chains, um, so that insiders can make money on that, right? And so that's a signal that maybe they can't hide. Anyways, if you're interested, um, I think I, I can't remember if I pub published the Z-scores. I should publish Z-scores so that everyone can use it. Um, again, Z-scores being how an asset is performing relative to itself, relative to its own moving average, um, so, that, uh, so that you can sort of overlay them all together at the zero point. So, um, yeah, that's... Uh, uh, shit coins, shit coins didn't do anything. Obviously, ETH pumped, but um, we don't, we we haven't seen much else. Things are relatively flat in that regard. Um, we could take a quick look at Bitcoin here. You'll notice that it's 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 basically riding at the top of this uh, of its standard deviation bands right now. I, I guess this looks it looks bullish, kind of. Um, Bitcoin did break this pleb line to the upside, um, so that's that's good for for Bitcoin. I'll take a look at the daily. So because the daily, when you're talking about breaking pleb lines. And, and drawing structures, usually you want to go with like big time frames. So the daily is a big one, weekly, monthly. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you're going to trade a little bit shorter term, the four hour, you can do that. Um, I use shorter time frames with the four hour because the wave magic lines show up better. Uh, so we're looking here at Bitcoin and this looks moderately bullish. Like this could plausibly move to the upside here. 
Uh, I don't know if that's what's actually going to happen. Personally, I have a I have a hard time buying stuff that's gone up a lot um, in value. But I mean, currently the markets the markets aren't flashing red signals at us uh, necessarily. The signals aren't as as uh, unambiguously bullish as they were at the end of last year and and at the beginning of this year. But th this is like this is plausible. You could you could see some more gains from Bitcoin. Um, personally, I, I don't see like if you're a trader, I can't see why the hell would you buy Bitcoin right here? Ethereum is the thing to buy. If you can catch a pullback, if you're lucky and you can catch a pullback on Ethereum, I would be buying that because at some point, whether it's next week or next month, these S1Bs are going to get finished and Ethereum is actually going to get listed onto the stock market. Um, and that's going to induce a significant amount of volume. Who knows how much, but it's going to at least indu induce some volume that matters for price. So if I'm betting right now, I'm not betting on Bitcoin. I'm betting on Ethereum. Um, so maybe we can actually catch ourselves uh, alt season round two. Alt season round one was kind of weak, if you ask me. I think a lot of us were really hoping to get, you know, like that that 20x, the 50x, the 100x on these altcoins. And, and if you know how to play in memes, then uh, then maybe you could maybe, maybe you could have uh, made some of those gains. But alt season hasn't really, you know, it's it's left something to be desired thus far. So um with regards to alt season, here is the Bitcoin.d, the dominance of Bitcoin across uh, compared to, to other to the rest of the crypto market cap. Um, you know, it's still it's make it's hovering above that 50% mark. It's you know, it's doing pretty good, I suppose. Maybe not if you look in the long term, right? Zoom out. Um, you can see that Bitcoin made it up here to 72% back in the day, right? Back before the uh, before the medical tyranny bull market, uh, the medical tyranny induced bull market. Uh, and it hasn't really been able to make it um, back, you know, back to those levels at all. In fact, it kind of got stopped out here at the low of that of that saga of that chapter of cryptocurrency. So at the moment, with Ethereum, you know, getting its its ETF, and uh, <laughs> one thing I thought as a side a side note here, one thing I thought was funny is that um, rather almost like I think I saw one on Twitter. It was like one Maximus. I was like, listen, guys. I'm not going to shit you. I'm just going to take the L here. Um, you know, it is what it is. I, I was like, hey, respect, bro. Like, at least you can, like, at least there's someone out there that can admit it. Um, but in terms of, like, the narratives that we've seen, now it's like, oh, uh, Pepe Coin's about to get an ETF too, right? So they're, at first, like, getting an ETF was, like, the sole magnificent shining crowning moment of Bitcoin milkshake uh, taking over governments that have no choice, Right. And it was that was the narrative for four months, and now the narrative is like, oh, every shit coin that you that that every shit coiner makes, like every meme is going to be on an ETF now, right? Like, notice the extreme vacillation there required. That is not a sign of intellectual honesty. Yet I digress. Bitcoin dominance right here. Um, it would be plausible for this thing to fall out of its range. Remember, we talked about for the past few weeks that um, this does look a little bit like weakness. This does kind of look a little bit like it was rolling over. Um, at this moment, it would not be surprising to see this thing kind of fall out of its range there. And if that happens, you know, everyone's kind of looking at this chart. If that happens, um, we, we really could potentially expect to see um, some violent moves to the downside, um, hopefully. Uh, I mean, I've still got some of my shitcoin positions rolling. Um, so hopefully, you know, I'd, I'd like to see those guys go up a lot uh, in value because who doesn't want gains, right? Um, that's why we're here is gains and for no other reason. Uh, just kidding, just kidding. Okay, let's take a look at some of the uh, alternative privacy coins, starting with, I guess, Darrow. <laughs> if we wanted to be derisive, we could start with Darrow. But hey, maybe Darrow deserves some derision here. Um, because, uh, so one thing that I, I walked away from last week with the impression that only a certain number of transactions were going to get unrolled for, from Darrow for like the last six months, and that it wasn't going to include sender and recipient. Um, but the reality is that, uh, and Luke Parker corrected me on this, the reality is that the entire chain is basically going to get unwound. Like I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but if it's payload and payload is, I can't remember. If it, so it's amounts. And then it's also either sender or recipient. I can't remember which one it is, but effectively the entire chain was pwned. Um, so yeah, the whole thing in Darrow is getting unwound eventually whenever, you know, the full attack vector is published. Uh, not just the last six months. Maybe that was because I gave too much credit to our, uh, our tech leads guest, um, ironically named tech leads, even though he doesn't apparently understand the tech. But at, at anyways, Darrow is taking a little bit of a tumble. This this was an interesting kind of formation here. It kind of looked like, um, to me, that looked a bit like a, a, a buy wall, right? Like trying to support price. Like there was this hard level that somebody out there was trying to prevent Darrow from, from going below, and now it's gone below that. So 
Um, uh, Darrow only has bad things in store for price here for the near term, guys. Like it's 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 not good. Um, I th there's obviously like nothing goes down in a straight line. There's probably opportunities to pick up some reverse reactions here. Um, but I just like what narrative do they have left? Like when you fuck up that badly, your chain that has existed for at least it's been trading for four years now and the whole thing gets unwound like that that's that is unsurmountable unrecoverable trust loss like that's what are you gonna do like you, you don't be getting into darrow guys thinking that you're getting a privacy coin just wait for dark fi they're gonna merge mine with monero like we should be friends we shouldn't be in competition and i felt like darrow had this sort of affinity scam vibes the whole time anyways like um sorry if you liked darrow sorry if you lost money on darrow that sucks uh you know but uh Hey, that's what happens when you speculate speculate um, on new tech, uh, especially new tech that was that was done by like one dude, right? Or like a, a, a couple guys. Um, okay, so now we've got Xano here. You think you think um, we get him to participate in Monerotopia? <laughs> I don't even know. Honestly, like I don't want to be too toxic here, but I don't even know why you would want them to. Like they're yeah, done. Like there's, they've, there's, they've got there's no, there's trust no like. Uh, I mean, there's it's. Is there any interest in what they're doing with their tech, though, from a technical standpoint? Like, if they, you know, if it can be be reformed into a a, a version that's not corrupted, that would what be a question for Luke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's yeah. the one that found the bug. If if there's anything interesting there, um, I would imagine. Yeah. I'm sure Luke can be found if he wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll let. You, uh, Wrap it up when you can, because I just have uh, people waiting to jump on now. We rounded up. Oh, uh, sure. Some okay. Yes. Yep. No worries. I'll be out in, in three minutes flat, bro. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So we'll skip Xano. Um, buy Xano if you want. You know, I don't know. GameStop had its had its moment, uh, and then it fell back down. Y you have to suspect that insiders are now playing with this, that they're now kind of juicing the, the social media. I just thought we should take a quick look at that and, you know, uh, j j just for fun. Um, there was, uh, macro, nothing interesting has happened in macro gold took a little bit of a pullback. Um, maybe there's one interesting thing slightly, the federal, uh, the U S liquidity is dropping off here. It's not that it's any major drop off, but it has been falling. Um, that's not exactly a good sign, right? That's, that's a sign of, of, Hey, where's the money going to come from for more gains? Um, maybe the federal government will just print another trillion dollars. Uh, reverse repos have flattened out. You can see they're, you know, sitting here flat. I wouldn't expect necessarily that this should go anywhere. Probably they're going to save some juice for the election um, if they really want to get Biden um, reelected. They, 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 they do that. They would need every little part of the, the narrative to just like fit together as much as they can. OK, whatever. Uh, dollar index uh, still in this kind of um, this sort of down channel right here. Um, just playing with everyone's emotions. Just kidding. Nobody cares about the dollar index. We only use it to figure out what the rest of the market's going to do. Um, macro stuff, nothing here, nothing important here, nothing signaling us in the bond market that there's trouble, um, ahead, at least not in the immediate term. And um, one thing, okay. So one of the big things I did want to point out was the S and P 500 and the NASDAQ had something that's called an engulfing bearish candle. You'll notice we're on the daily, um, an engulfing bearish candle is when you open higher and then like you open higher than the previous day. And in fact, we open higher than it opened at all time highs on uh, on Thursday, but then it just fell down and it actually closed lower. Um, let's take a look at the weekly. Yeah, the weekly doesn't show that, um, uh, but the daily definitely does. So that's called an embar uh, a bearish engulfing pattern uh, or candle, and usually that tends to be bearish. So that doesn't necessarily, again, like don't don't take me wrong here. That doesn't mean that like that that it's over and you know we're going to crash 50 percent on the stock market now but it does kind of signal the potential um for some pullback here for some amount of pullback that could happen so um i i will just show you this very very briefly this is the regression analysis on the s p 500 um i did this the other day and i meant to show it to you guys like a week or two ago i don't know why i didn't i guess i just forgot uh anyways this is the regression analysis. so the green is the lower boundary of the s p 500 and then the blue is like the uh like the best fit line of all of the data um i only analyzed it starting from 1913 and on the uh, the astute listener here will understand why 1913 was the date that we started the regression analysis um, but I just thought it was interesting. Maybe I'll publish that later or something. I don't know. Um, with that, uh, you know, I guess I've rambled, uh, rambled on long enough. Bros and uh, happy trading, happy times. Um, don't get wrecked. Peace.